Uh, Pastor Rick, I don't know if you, if you thought back, you, you, you threw out some dates, but I actually thought about this a little bit more. It was back, it was in 2001 oh, really? that, that I came to the camp, which means oh, you're, you're a lot older than you thought that you were, because uh, we, we've known each other for, for a long time. When, when I came to the campground there, that was my, my first time getting uh, the, the privilege to meet your pastor. Um, I had been given the mandate from our higher ups that this camp needed to be turned around pretty quickly. It was performing well below its capacity, well below its potential. And I began to meet with all of the staff members one-on-one -on -one and in departments and shared the vision that I felt like God had laid on my heart. And when I got to the food department and uh, Rick was not overseeing the food department at the time, and when I met with the person that was be his direct supervisor and said, man, I'm really excited. Here's, the, here's what I'm thinking. Here's what God's laid on my heart. And she kind of went. But when I got with Pastor Rick and began to talk to him, I felt like I was preaching because he's like, amen, this is what I want. This is what I've been thinking about the whole time. And one of the things that I knew right away is that you were going to be leading that department and more, that, that God had a call on your life of leadership. One of the tasks that we had at the beginning was to change a culture, change a culture. This, the people that worked there had accepted so much less than what was possible for them. Now, culture is one of those things that's really, really hard to define. We live in the culture all the time. I promise you, you have a culture here at Country Chapel. You have a culture at your place of work. You have a culture in your home. We had a culture at the campground we had to deal with. And you know how you know when uh, you've discovered what part of your culture is? When somebody from outside comes in and breaks one of your unwritten rules. <laughs> That's how you know. You say, oh, that oh, didn't realize that, that really bothered me that they did that. And you think, well, wait a minute. How would they know that we don't do it that way? Yeah. Right? Well, I'll give you an example. I was an associate pastor at a church. We had a brand new staff member that came on. He'd only been there a couple days. I was standing in his office door and I was talking to him. And behind me, I could hear our senior pastor had come in and was walking through the, the front area. And he's greeting some of the people. And he starts down the hallway. And this young, uh, new uh, guy pushes past me, says, excuse me a second. And he steps out into the hallway. And by this time, our, our pastor is almost down the end of the hallway. And with a big, loud voice, he calls out to him by his first name. And you could almost hear in the office, everything just go. <laughs> People held their breath because in our church, you never called the senior pastor by his first name. There was always a title at the beginning as a mark of reverence or respect for his office. Now, I would have never in a million years ever thought when I was giving this guy kind of bringing him up to speed that I would ever say to him, oh, by the way, you always address him as pastor or reverend. Never would have thought of that. That was one of the cultural rules that got broken. And all of a sudden, then we knew about it. Now, we live in a culture that operates a certain way. And as Christians that are wanting to bring the light of the gospel the salt and the light that Jesus called us to be, there's going to be times that people are going to get upset with you. You're going to say something and you're going to hear, Ur -ur. <laughs> but, and you just broke a rule of culture. And that's an okay thing. Because that means that your salt might have hit an open wound. That means your light probably shined in a dark place. Okay? That's, that's all right. But I want us to see tonight, I want to share you, with you some scriptures of how the Holy Spirit helps us in that regard. And, and we're going to start in kind of an unusual spot, a story that you probably wouldn't think of, because we're going to go back to, into the Old Testament in the book of Second Chronicles. Now, let me set the historic background here. The kingdoms are divided. The northern kingdom of Israel, they have been going away from God about as fast as they can go. Now, they still profess it with their mouth. 
They still give some lip service. They still have some things set up that make it look like they're still following God. In fact, they still even invoke his name every once in a while in doing this. Now, the southern kingdom of Judah, they're not too far on their heels. They, they are starting to slide a little bit more with them. Part of that is because several of the kings of Judah start to intermarry with the kings of the north of Israel and begin to adopt some of their lifestyle. And they begin to ally themselves in other ways. And this is what we see here in Second Chronicles 18. Jehoshaphat, a king of Judah, had great wealth and honor, and he allied himself with Ahab, who is one of the kings, one of the evil kings of the northern kingdom, by marriage. Some years later, he went down to visit Ahab in Samaria. Ahab slaughtered many sheep and cattle for him, and the people with him and urged him to attack Ramoth Gilead. Ahab, king of Israel, asked Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, will you go with me against Ramoth Gilead? And without thinking about it, Jehoshaphat replied, I am as you are, my people as your people. We will join you in the war. And then Jehoshaphat thought about what he just said, because he said, oh, also, Jehoshaphat also said to the king of Israel, first seek the counsel of the Lord. A little side note. You ever do that? Hey, here's my plans, God. Here's what I want to do. Will you bless this? Instead of saying, God, what do you want me to do that I know your blessing is going to be on it? So right away, Jehoshaphat said, sure, Ahab, sounds great. Let's do it. And then he says, oh, wait a minute. Maybe we better check and see what God says about this. So the king of Israel brought together the prophets, 400 men, and asked them, shall we go to war against Ramoth Gilead, or shall I refrain? Go, they answered, for God will give it into the king's hand. But Jehoshaphat asked, is there not a prophet of the Lord here whom we can inquire of? Somebody that is truly listening for God's voice, is following what God says. The king of Israel answered Jehoshaphat, There is still one man through whom we can inquire of the Lord, but I hate him. He never prophesies anything good about me, but always bad. He is Micaiah, the son of Imla. The king should not say that, Jehoshaphat replied. So the king of Israel called one of his officials and said, Bring Micaiah, son of Imla, at once, dressed in their royal robes. The king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, were sitting on their thrones at the threshing floor by the entrance to the gate of Samaria with all the prophets prophesying before them. Now Zedekiah, son of Kenanah, had made iron horns, and he declared, This is what the Lord says. With these you will gore the Arameans until they are destroyed. All the prophets were prophesying the same thing. Attack Ramoth Gilead and be victorious, they said, for the Lord will give it into the king's hand. The messenger who had gone to summon Micaiah said to him, Look, as one man, the other prophets are predicting success for the king. Let your word agree with theirs and speak favorably. Now, Pastor Rick had contacted me. He said, Can you come and speak? I said, I'd love to. One morning, I sat down and I sent him a text. And I said, Hey, by the way, what's the theme for your messages? And then I opened up, I picked up my phone, and I went to the YouVersion Bible app, and I just resumed a Bible reading plan that I had been on. And I came to this passage in Second Chronicles 18, and something stood out to me here, which I'll show you in just a second. And I said, oh, that's interesting. And I started writing down some notes, and I went back, and I read a little bit more, and I started writing down some other notes. And then Pastor Rick texted me, and he said... I'm going to quote it for you. For the theme, unity in the Holy Spirit is what I keep hearing. And what I had just written down in my notes after looking at this was these words. Unity is not conformity. Look at what he says here, this messenger that comes to Micaiah. As one man, the other prophets are predicting success. Literally translated in the Hebrew, that phrase means with one mouth. So these guys were not only speaking the same message, they were actually parroting the same words. 
It wasn't just the same message. They said, oh, let's say the exact same words. Go back, let me show you here. In verse number five where it says, go, they answered. Most translations of the Bible put in there, go, they all answered. They all said this. Look at verse number nine. All the prophets were prophesying before them. And then when Zedekiah makes this little elaborate display with the iron horns, look at verse number 11. All the other prophets were prophesying the same thing. And so when this messenger comes, he says to Micaiah, listen, everybody is speaking the same message, the same words. Your words need to match their words. Because if you say something different, don't do that. Don't rock the boat. Don't throw water on what's going on here. Just say the same words that we're saying. Micaiah, I love this guy. Verse number 13, he says, As surely as the Lord lives, I can only tell him what my God says. Okay? And if that makes people go, which actually, if you read the rest of the story, that is what happened. When he came in, here's what he did. He walked in and parroted the words. They said, what does God say? Go and you will be successful. That's, that's what he did. And they're like, come on. How many times do we have to tell you? Just t say the truth. Like, okay, well, here's, here's what I saw. You're, you're not going to be successful in this at all. And King Ahab says, didn't I tell you he never says anything good about me? But this is what culture wants you to do. Don't rock the boat. Don't say anything that makes us uncomfortable. And you know what? We get fearful of that. We, we, I call it the fear of the or else. Go along with us or else we'll cancel you. Say what we're saying or else we're going to ignore you. We won't include you in our group. We'll say weird things about you. We'll, we'll call you weird names because you're not going along with what we're going along with. But unity is not conformity and it's not mimicry. Let me just say what everybody else is saying. Look at in, in your notes, in your printout here. I gave you, I like this out of the Amplified Bible from Romans chapter 12. You, you know the passage well, I'm sure. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Okay, but listen to this first part of verse number two. I, I like how the Amplified Version brings this out. Do not be conformed to this world or this age fashioned after and adapted to its external superficial customs. See, here's the difference, friends. Unity always comes from inside. It's a choice that you make to be unified Conformity is external pressure. Do it our way or else. Okay? So what Paul is saying here is don't feel the or else pressure so that you try to just mimic, conform with what they do, but let your mind be transformed by the Holy Spirit so that you can speak what is true. Look at the rest of this verse here. Be transformed, be changed by the entire renewal of your mind, by its new ideals and its new attitude, so that you may prove for yourselves what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God, even the thing which is good and acceptable and perfect in his sight for you. Now, think about somebody asked Jesus once, what's the most important thing? If we're going to boil it all down, what do we need to know? Jesus said, love God and love your neighbor. Be in unity with what God's message is, just as God is unified in his love and his message for us. And then out of the overflow of that, find ways to get on the same page with your neighbors. Okay, Not, well, I'm just going to copy them. I'll, I'll, just, I'll do what they're doing so I don't rock their boat. But I'm going to speak the truth to them in love because my mind has been transformed. Now, look at how Jesus addresses this in uh, John uh, chapter 8. Jesus is talking to um, some Jewish people about uh, their mis misconceptions of the Scripture. Now, let's again, let's give some context here, okay? If you, were, if you were a Jewish man, there was a prayer that you prayed twice a day 
that part of your prayer started off like this. God, I thank you that you didn't make me a woman or a Gentile. Okay. Now, does that give you some insight into what their cultural mindset was? Okay. When Jesus came on the scene, he hung out a lot with women and with Gentiles. And they're going, the, all these Jewish leaders are going, Ur -ur -ur. wait a minute, you're not doing it the way, line up with what we're doing. Line up with what we're doing. What did Micaiah say? I can only speak what I hear from God. Right. Jesus did the same thing. I can only speak, the only words that I speak are the ones that my Father is giving me to speak. Any word that you have heard me speak, it's only because he said it to me first, and now I'm saying it to you. Now, if that makes you and your culture go, and, and get mad because you're rocking our boat, so be it. But I'm going to speak this way. Okay, so John chapter 8. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins um, is a slave to sin. Now, a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a, a son, belong, uh, but it belongs to the, the son forever. So if the son sets you free, the truth of Jesus sets you free, you're free indeed. There's no more of that Oh man, I feel trapped to this or else. Okay, we see in the in the gospels where people they say to him, if you don't say it this way, we we will remove you from the synagogue. There'll be an or else here. But he says the son will set you free indeed. Okay? Now, their reply was, wait a minute. We haven't been slaves to anything. We're Abraham's son. We're in with God just because of of who we are. I, I would make a wager with you that if we were to go into town and we were to ask people on the street, if we just ask them a question like this without any qualifications, if we just said, are you a Christian? Most of the people would say yes. But by virtue of the fact that we live in the nation that we live in, most people just kind of assume, well, this is a Christian nation, I'm a Christian. Now, you'll run into a couple, oh, no, I'm an atheist. But there'll be some people, oh, yeah, I'm a Christian according to, to what standard? Just because you live here? Well, this is what he's dealing with with these, uh, these guys here. Oh, yeah, we're, we're in with God just because of our heritage, just because of our pedigree, just because of where we exist. And Jesus says, no, there, there's a truth that can only be revealed to you by the Holy Spirit that will set you free. Paul picks up the same, uh, spot, the same thought in 2 Corinthians. Look what he says in 2 Corinthians 3. Anyone who turns to the Lord, the veil on their mind, on their heart, is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit is, where the Holy Spirit is, there is freedom. That's what Jesus just said. The one that the Son sets free is free indeed. Verse 18. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate, gaze on, meditate, we, we sang that song, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. When I just think about that and meditate on that and the Lord's glory, I am being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. That's what Paul said in Romans chapter 12. Don't just go along with the culture. Have the veil removed from your heart, from your mind, so you can gaze on the beauty of who Jesus really is. Let the Holy Spirit bring that to your heart and your mind. Now, you see what Micaiah said? I can only say what God says. I can't say anything else. God's word has to be revealed to me. Now, we've got an incredible collection here. We got an incredible book here. Let me just ask you a real quick true or false question. Okay. This book contains the word of God. True. False. Yes. This is the word of God. Doesn't just contain it. There's other books that purport or make a claim that, that they contain some words from God. This is the word of God. This is our measuring stick. And one of the things that Jesus said the Holy Spirit would do to us is help us to take this and apply it 
to the difficult situations where culture seems like, okay, how do we address this? Now, I didn't put this in your notes, so if you want to jot it down or look, you got a Bible in the back of your seat in front of you, Acts chapter 15, there is a major potential problem. What, did I put that one in there? Oh, okay, good. I'm better than I thought. Acts chapter 15, there, there is a problem here. Right at the beginning of the church, we could have two churches. We get two Christian churches here right at the beginning. Remember the prayer that the Jewish men prayed? God, I thank you that I'm not a woman and I'm not a Gentile. The Jews believed that the Gentiles, anybody who wasn't a Jew, was just here to be fuel for the fires of hell. When they start to become followers of Jesus, there's a lot of Jews that put on the brakes. And then they say, okay, well, hold on a second. Hold on. I guess it's okay if they become a Christian, but then they need to become a Jew too. They need to convert to Judaism. They need to be conformed to our culture. So Acts chapter 15, there's a council that is convened because this could become a big problem here. This could split the church right in its very infancy. And there's different people that get up. There's the, the Jews that get up and say, hey, look, we're glad that they've become followers of Jesus, but they need to become Jews now as well. They need to go through all of the rituals and they need to follow all the sacrifices and they need to do all these things. And then Peter gets up and shares his experience of how he spoke at Cornelius' house and how prior to that God told him, don't call anything unclean that I've called clean. And the Holy Spirit falls on all the people in Cornelius' house. Paul and Barnabas get up and they share a similar story of their experience as well. And everybody's sitting there listening. And listen to James, the half-brother of Jesus. He's kind of chairing this meeting because when he speaks here, his word is almost the last word. But I want you to hear what, what he says here. Um, when they finished, James spoke up. Brothers, listen to me. Simon has described how God at first showed his concern by taking from the Gentiles a people for himself. Listen to what he says here. The words of the prophets are in agreement with this. Just like Micaiah, I can only speak what God says. James says, I hear a lot of voices. Which ones ring with the same note? as what God's word says. The words of the prophets are in agreement with this. And then he begins to quote from the prophet Isaiah on how Isaiah, God spoke to him and said, the Gentiles are going to come in. This isn't a salvation. This isn't good news just for the Jews. This is for everybody. And so James says, you know, Gentiles, we're glad that you're a part of the, the body of Christ now. We're glad you're brothers and sisters. There are a couple of practices that you do that's going to make it difficult for us to be kind of simpatico, for us to hang out with you. So there's just a couple of things that we're going to ask you to do. We don't want you to convert to Judaism. We, there's just a couple of things that we would ask you to be in unity with us to abstain from doing these things. Okay? Now, I said James had almost the last word. The other word that we see throughout this sounds similar at first to back in 2 Chronicles 18 when all the prophets were saying the same words, but they were all mimicking each other. They were all parroting each other. It's not what we hear here. It says that the whole church said that this was a good, good idea. And they choose a couple of guys to go and deliver the message. And when they come to deliver the message, they tell the people, we were all in agreement with this. But I love this line as well. It says, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to bring this message to you. And the response of the Gentiles was to bless those messengers, to send them back to Jerusalem in peace and say, good, we're going to be a part of the same family together. Not conformity. They weren't saying, we're going to force this on you. They're saying, we would like you to, to see this through the eyes of the Holy Spirit like we did. Does it resonate with your spirit? And they said, it does. It seems good to us and to the Holy Spirit. Remember that unity is a choice that only I can make from the inside. Okay? Conformity is what's forced on me from the outside. The Holy Spirit began to speak to all of them. 
and they all came to the same conclusion. Well, where did this come from? Well, this is exactly what Jesus had said. He said, I want you to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Now he's speaking to Jewish people at the time. He says, so go to Jerusalem first. Those are some Jews that you know. Then go to Judea. You're going to have some Jews, but you're also going to run into some Gentiles there. And then go to Samaritans. They probably say that again, Jesus. Go to where? The, the, the half-breeds, the traitors, the ones we go out of our way to avoid. Go to them. Uh, all right. And then, okay, I guess. Then where else? And then go to the ends of the earth. You mean to the Gentiles? You, we go, we go, we're going to go to the Gentiles? And he said, yes. How are you going to do this? You will be empowered by the Holy Spirit to do this. And so on very next chapter in, in uh, the book of Acts, Luke records for us in Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, the celebration, there are people from nations all over the place that are there to worship. When the Holy Spirit falls on those Jewish believers and they begin to praise God in languages that they had never learned before. Now, they didn't all speak the same words. They weren't parroting the same words. There's multiple languages. Luke lists many different uh, regions and countries that people came from. And they stopped and said, wait a minute, what do, what do, I, what do I hear? I, up over there in that upper room, I hear somebody in my mother tongue, the language that my ears are accustomed to, I hear somebody up there Worshiping God, saying how amazing he is. And somebody else who barely speaks the same language with the traveler next to them says, yeah, I, I hear in my language too. They were unified, but they were not speaking the same words. It was the same message, but they weren't the same words. Kind of like when you listen to your worship team up here. It's kind of boring when everybody just sings the same note or plays the same note when it's all just kind of unison. But did you hear them up here? You hear the different parts being sung? That's what unity is. That's what the Holy Spirit wants to do with us is he wants to say, hey, you sing a great tenor part. You sing a bass. You sing an alto. You sing a soprano. You play this part. You play this part. You play this part. Because we all go to different communities. We all operate in different cultures. See, it's going to be really hard for me to come into the culture of, say, your home, where you have your own cultural rules. I might walk in there and break one of your rules and not realize it. And then it's going to be, it's harder for me to be able to share the good news there because people are sitting there, going, how did he not know he broke these rules? He should have known better than this. And they're not listening to anything else I'm saying. But in your home, where you already know the culture and you don't break the rules because you know what the rules are, you can sing the notes that the Holy Spirit is giving you there to be salt and light there. Same thing in your workplace, in your neighborhood, in your schools, where you go shopping, where you hang out with people. Don't, don't say, oh, I, I need to get Pastor Rick out here because so, he, he's, a, he's a pastor, he's a preacher, he can come and share the gospel with him. He doesn't know the culture like you do. You know the culture better than he does. And the same Holy Spirit that is in him, that was in Peter, that was in Paul, that was in James, that's in me, is in you. He wants to empower you to be his witness in those places where he's placed you. Now, listen, the, the only things that are necessary for somebody to get to heaven is believe in their heart that Jesus is Lord and confess it with their mouth. That's it, right? We, we don't need to set up well and then you need to go to this church and then you need to do this and that, that those are man-made rules. Okay? We, we don't need that. Okay? I, I just want people to acknowledge that they need Jesus as a Savior and they confess that with their mouth. I need Jesus as a Savior. He's the only one that can forgive me of my sins. How do I do that? Well, I need to do it in the culture where the Holy Spirit has placed me. See, every one of you, you were created on purpose and for a purpose. 
there's not one person in this room that is the same as anybody else in this room. In fact, I'll go farther than that. Of the billions of people on the planet, there is nobody like you. Of all the people that have come before in history, there's nobody like you. Of all the people that will come after you as long as the Lord tarries, there won't be anybody like you. God never sits in heaven and goes, you know what? I had a model back in Italy in the 14th century that I really liked. I want to bring that one back. <laughs> after he made you, he breaks the mold because he doesn't need another you. So when you are being you with the unique gifts and talents and abilities and even quirkinesses that you have, the Holy Spirit can use that in your culture. You don't have to try to be somebody else. Be you, because that's who God made you to be, and that's how you glorify Him, is when you're you. So friends, if you know Jesus as your Savior, that's wonderful. You're going to go to heaven. We sang the song, I'll fly away. You are going to fly away. If today was the day you took your last breath, you were going to fly away into His presence. But don't go alone. Take other people with you. And you can only do that if you allow the Holy Spirit to empower you. There's going to be, all of us have blind spots. Okay, We need the Holy Spirit to help keep removing the veil from us. Keep taking some of those, have I just accepted this automatically? I haven't even really thought about it. I, I didn't know, just kind of like I said, how would I ever say to one of our staff members, oh, by the way, you've got to address our senior pastor like this. Never thought about it. It's a blind spot. Okay, And then I became aware of it. That's what the Holy Spirit will do to you. That's why sometimes when you are reading your Bible, you can come to a spot and you read it and you go, where'd this come from? And you look at it and you go, wait, I underlined this before. I highlighted this before, but I, I don't think I saw this before. Because the Holy Spirit says, I, I, let me show you what you need right now. Let me remove that veil. Let me help you because I know what you have ahead of you this week, this year. I know what situations you're going to walk into. And I want you to be equipped and prepared for that. What a way to live. To know that every step that we take, every place that we go, that we're on mission. That at any moment, the Holy Spirit can just say to us, hey, this is what you need to say here. This is what you need to do here. Now, listen, like I said before, you're going to say something, you're going to do something, and there's going to be times that you're going to, you'll feel the breaks from people around you, or you'll see the look like this, or you'll see the people turn around and walk away from you, and that's okay. That means you spoke the truth. You spoke the truth, and it got through. They heard you, okay? Don't need to argue with them. Don't need to fight with them. Just be salt. Just be light. But know that some people don't like the salt on their wounds. They don't like the light shining in their darkness. That's okay. Be salt. Be light. Don't just say, I'm saved. I got my salvation. And leave it at that. But press on like these followers of Jesus did. They said, the task ahead of us seems insurmountable on our own. And Jesus said it is. That's why you need to be empowered. You need to be baptized with the Holy Spirit so that you are equipped, prepared, ready for every situation that you step in. Okay? And so I challenge you, church, if you haven't done that, that there's the, the Bible shows us a lot of different ways that people are baptized in the Holy Spirit. Sometimes they're, Acts chapter 2, they're just praying together. Sometimes... Uh, that people are, somebody comes and prays with them and they're baptized in the Holy Spirit. All, all it takes is just a willing person to say, I'm willing to do whatever you want me to do. I'm willing to be used wherever you want to take me. And the Holy Spirit will use you and empower you as he needs to. So press on to find that fullness of the Holy Spirit. And then, as Paul says later on, keep being filled with the Spirit. Don't just say, oh, well, that felt good once. Don't, you know, revival week is great, but live it out for the next 365 days. Keep living in that revival power everywhere that you go. Okay? Don't try to conform. Don't try to mimic. But just be you and let the Holy Spirit empower everything that you do. Craig's new book, When Sheep Bite, is available now. To order, go to craigtowens.com.